Therefore, it's now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Finance. On April 19, the Minister of Finance stood in the Legislature and said that hydro rates are going down. But yesterday, everyone's hydro rates went up. So my question, Mr. Speaker, to the Minister of Finance is, is he willing to stay in the Legislature again and say that his hydro rates are going down? Thank you. Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, what I reference, the member opposite knows all too well, that investments were made by our government to the tune of over $30 billion to ensure that we have a greater integrity and ensure that we have stability in our grid. And furthermore, we eliminated dirty coal from our, yeah. our emissions uh, in our province. 90% of our emissions are now free of carbon dioxide, and the member opposite knows that all too well, and those come at a cost, at a cost to ensure that our future is protected and that we became and become more competitive going forward. He knows that our long-term plan had estimated much higher fees, and that has not occurred. And he knows also that the reason that we are going is we're going to ensure that going forward we'll continue to provide that integrity in our grid and provide further stimulus in our economy, and that has been happening, Mr. Speaker. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Speaker, again to the Minister of Finance, the question was the Minister of Finance made a contention his hydro rates were going down. That is not happening anywhere else in the province. So the question is, what special deal does the Minister of Finance have that just his hydro rates are going down? Because of the latest increase, everyone in Ontario's rate is going to go up $70. And I realize it's part of their talking points to talk about coal, despite the fact the phase-out started under the Progressive Conservatives. So instead of talking points, Mr. Speaker, instead of talking points, because every political party agreed on the phase Order, please. Order, please. Start the clock. Order. Thank you. Finish, please. So, Mr. Speaker, instead of answering a different question, a very simple, straightforward question to the Minister of Finance. You said your hydro rates were going down. Are you willing to make that claim again today? Question. Can you expect Ontarians to believe that? Because I certainly don't. Thank you. Get it out now because I'm going to tighten up. Minister? The legacy of the Progressive Conservative Party of the past were blackouts in this province, Mr. Speaker, and continued brownouts that always occurred, Mr. Speaker. Furthermore, they left us a legacy of tremendous debt because of the mismanagement of the electricity system that we are only now paying off completely. And, Mr. Speaker, furthermore, we have now invested and Please, Minister. We have invested more than 15,000 kilometres of transmission and local distribution across our province, the distance one and a half times from coast to coast of Canada, Mr. Speaker. And anyone who's promising you now that they're going to reduce rates is not telling you the truth. In the end, Mr. Speaker, in the end, Mr. Speaker, Sentence wrap up. Anyone who promises lower rates is promising a return to dirty coal in this province, Mr. Speaker. That's what they're talking about. We are not going to do that in this side of the house. Final supplementary. 
Mr. Speaker, once again to the Minister of Finance, the, the drive-by smear on coal didn't work in Whitby, Oshawa, because there was no truth to it. Now back to the question and back to the real concern, and that's the hydro rates that everyone in Ontario sees as going up except for the Minister of Finance. Now, let me give you an example. Last week, I was in Thunder Bay meeting with mayors and councillors from northwestern Ontario communities. I would note that in 2015, the Federation of Northern Municipalities passed a resolution calling for lower hydro rates as it's been disastrous on the north. Resolute Forestry, where I toured, told me they have to shut down parts of their plant every day during peak rate periods to keep their costs down. I guess they don't get the Charles Souza special. So, Mr. Speaker, when will this government stop turning their back Forcing. on Northern Ontario? Mr. Speaker, when will this government actually have energy policies that don't cripple Northern Ontario? Okay. I uh, remind all members uh, we use each other's titles and or writings in this House. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Energy. Mr. Speaker, uh, the, uh, the statement that the uh, Leader of the Opposition was referring to is a statement that in our two 2013 long-term energy plan, we had certain projected prices. And what the Minister of Finance said is we're coming well below those projected prices. We're reducing from what we were projecting, Mr. Speaker. But I do want to thank the member. I want to thank the member for supporting our nuclear refurbishment program, because the nuclear refurbishment program over the next 30 years, Mr. Speaker, will put into the grid electricity price at 7.7 .7 cents per kilowatt hour on average, Mr. Speaker, and it'll be clean energy, Mr. Speaker. He doesn't mention that the recent wind prices came in, Mr. Speaker, at 8.5 cents on average per kilowatt hour, Mr. Speaker. Okay. I'm going to ramp it up since you are. We're going to move to warnings. Finish, please. Speaker, the recent wind prices came in less than the average price uh, of electricity in the grid, Mr. Speaker, at 8.5 cents. And for Northern Ontario, Northern Ontario industrial prices are the third lowest in North America, better than all the Canadian provinces, better than all the U.S. states. If you want to see them, look, look, look online, and you'll see all the. Thank you. Time's up. When I stand, uh, you sit. Uh, in case you didn't hear, when it was really quiet, I said we're moving to warnings. The shouting's going to stop. New question, Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, May 1st was a sad day for Ontario. IBI treatment for autistic children, five and over, is no longer available because of this government's question. callousness. My question is for the Minister of Finance. Let me share a story of a letter I got from seven-year-old Warren and his family from ba Baileyboro. He was diagnosed with autism at age of three. His parents immediately registered Warren for IBI therapy. About one month ago, Warren's parents were notified that Warren was seventh on the waiting list for IBI treatment. They were elated. Unfortunately, because of this government's decision, the rug has been pulled underneath of this family and Warren. It's not right. Mr. Speaker, after so many years on the waiting list, why is this government proceeding with this devastating cuts that takes away IBI treatment from Warren and his Question. family? We know how much the minister was upset. Why did the Minister of Finance allow this cut in his budget? Thank you. Mr. Finance. Minister of Children and Youth Services, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Children and Youth Services. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the, the Leader of the Opposition for the question. It's very important to acknowledge that we are not removing kids from service. In fact, we are taking those kids who are waiting for IBI, who are over five, who are not in the right development to window, and putting them into immediate service, Speaker. 333 million new dollars, 16,000 new spaces. I acknowledge it's a shift. I acknowledge it's a transition. I and many of my colleagues, and I believe members of the opposition, have been meeting with families, and uh, uh, I've made sure that everyone in the legislature has all the facts, that they understand the step-by-step -step process by which this transformation will take place, and that the new autism program will provide longer, more intense services, and will be tailored to the individual needs Answer. of the child. Thank, Thank you, Thank you. Supplementary. 
Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Finance, because this is his cut. You know, when the government cuts the service, they say it's a, it's a shift. It's a transformation. The Minister of Energy is warned. Leader. Mr. Speaker, it appears we have struck a nerve. We're decoding their language. A shift is their word for a cut. A transformation is their word for a cut. And they like to say, sure, they're taking away IBI treatment, but they have enhanced APA. Well, I'll do it. Uh, the Deputy Minister of Finance is warned. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, they say they have enhanced ABA, but we now learn from the regional service providers there is no such thing as enhanced ABA. There is no enhanced treatment for Warren. He's been kicked off the wait list and given a check that Answer. will only cover a few months of treatment. Warren and his family deserve better from this government. So my question is directly to the Minister of Finance. Autism doesn't end at five. Do you agree Thank with you. that fundamental concept? Yes or no? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. The member from Stormont, Dundas, and South Glengarry is warned. Minister. Well, Speaker, of course we agree that autism doesn't end at five, and I'm very concerned about the opposition positioning this investment of $333 million as a cut. Speaker, we have 16,000 new, uh, 16, new spaces that uh, will be provided, and children who are currently receiving IBI will continue to receive that, and guess who will be determining what uh, their transition is? Experts at their next six-month checkup. And Speaker, I think it's important to acknowledge that there are stakeholders who support this change. So Leslie Sweet, the chair of Regional Autism Providers of Ontario, says we're very excited about this historic investment and what it means for children and youth for, uh, who have autism and for their families. More families will receive the right service at the right time. And Suzanne Jacobson, founder of Quick Start Early Intervention Autism Program, said parents spoke and they were heard. The right service Answer. at the right time. Individualized, expanded and timely services will be life-changing. We applaud the Ontario government's investment of $333 Thank you. million. Dollars. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, once again for the Minister of Finance. You know, the, the government's backbenches seem to share the government's callous disregard to what this means for families with autism. You know, on Twitter last week, the member from Beaches East York called the parents of autistic children bullies. What? These are parents that are frustrated with the province with the province because they can't get the treatment they need. Mr. Speaker, first the Liberal government took people like Warren's parents to court. Now they're kicking kids like Warren off the wait list. When will the government stop their war on autistic children and parents who love them? It's not the right thing. Correct course. Minister. Well, Speaker, I'd like to know when the leader of opposition would st stop using the wrong terminologies about kicking kids off lists. That implies they're not getting support. They are getting immediate support. Those children he's talking about will go to immediate service, Speaker. It is fear mongering, and I'm very concerned because. This does affect families, and I appreciate that, Speaker, but it doesn't help, quite frankly, when the opposition isn't communicating. Finish, Minister, please. And it would also be helpful, Speaker, if the opposition talked about what this will do for the children on wait lists he speaks about. We will reduce wait lists for autistic children by half in two Member years. Member from Dufferin Caledon is one. Uh, 2020. So, Speaker, I just wish the opposition would get the facts. His critic has had Thank the you. briefing, and it's important they convey the facts during Answer. this time of transition. Zero. Thank you. No question. The leader of the third party. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. The Premier created a scandal with her system of secret fundraising quotas. Uh, fundraising quotas. Can the active, uh, Acting Premier tell Ontarians? Stop, stop. 
My comments uh, still stand for this next round of questions. It's for the entire time of question period. So if you want to get warned, the next step is that you're named. Finish, please. Can the acting premier tell Ontarians which minister had the quota for raising $430,000 from Greenfield Specialty Alcohols and which ministers are responsible for $160 million in Liberal government support? Back to Greenfield, Speaker. Thank you. Minister of Finance. Uh, Minister, I, I, there's two questions there. One is uh, the degree of investments that we're making to grow our agricultural industry and supporting rural Ontario, which is critical. We recognize that. Uh, ethanol and our growth in ethanol will help the industry as well as move us into the low carbon economy. And of course, the selection process in that is very nonpartisan, and the Ministry of Issues are the ones that evaluate the companies and it goes through a uh, four step competitive due diligence. But, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite also talks about fundraising activities, and I think the leader of the third party, who's strongly defending her secret union backed Shell Corporation, is clear as to why the NDP have not decided to act on the reforms that we're putting forward, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Speaker, increasingly Ontarians are concerned that this government and this Premier have manipulated and abused the rules around political fundraising in this province beyond anything that we have seen in the past. And now this Premier says, just trust me when I rewrite the rules on my own and use my majority to pass them. Speaker, it is simply not credible. When will this Premier and this Liberal government realize that the rules on how parties, election, parties and elections are financed rather, must be seen as credible by the people and agree to put aside her partisan process? Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, credibility is exactly what's in question here from the member of the third party. We, uh, they obviously are stuck in process because they want to delay further the reforms that are necessary to meet the very demands of the public, and we recognize that. So our question to the Leader of the Opposition is, do you believe that we need to reform third-party advertising? Right? Do you believe that we need to ban corporate and union donations? Do you believe that we need to reduce the maximum amount of those donations? And do you believe that we need to have the constraints necessary on loans and loan guarantees and phantom landowners, Mr. Speaker? And do you believe that that reform on by-elections are also important? Do you believe that we need an overall reduction in our spending limits by central parties in election periods and limits between those elections? Mr. Speaker, do you, need, do you believe that we need new leadership? and a nomination campaign yes, spending sir. limits on those donation opportunities during those campaigns. I believe consensus around this room and certainly outside this legislature believes we do. Thank you. And that's what we're putting forward and we expect. Thank you. The government has spent the last week or more attempting to smear anyone who wants an open, transparent panel to make new election rules. And in fact, they Stop the clock, sorry. Finished. Democracy Watch, newspaper editorial boards, the Green Party of Ontario, the official opposition, and the NDP are somehow all trying to delay. Yet, when given multiple, multiple opportunities to move forward on a fast-moving independent process that we would report back to this legislature by the end of September, the Premier and her government have repeatedly simply said no. The real question is, why is the Liberal Party of Ontario insisting on a partisan process that question. they control? Mr. Speaker, the real question is, why aren't we moving on the piece of legislation before this Democratic House, Mr. Speaker? That is the place to do our business, and it does require public comment. It does have debate. It is a democratic process. The real question is, why are you defending? The, I'm sorry, Mr. Speaker. Why is the, third, the member of the third party, the leader of the third party, defending a secret union-backed shell corporation? Why are they continuing to throw up load blocks in the process? What we need is action, Mr. Speaker. We're prepared to act now. Yeah. New question, leader of the third party. Thank you so much, uh, Speaker. My second question uh, is also for the Acting Premier. Since January, Ontario has lost 800 full and part-time nurses. That's nearly 200 per month, Speaker. When will the Liberal government stop firing nurses? Thank you. Minister of Finance. 
Mr. Speaker, I know the uh, Minister of Health will want to respond to this, but it's important to recognize that we are investing more. Let me be clear. The opposition continues to make disingenuous claims about our health care system. In reality, withdraw. I withdraw, Mr. Speaker. The opposition fails to tell what is in fact the facts. The reality is that we've increased hospital funding by 53 per cent since 2003, from $11 billion to $17.3 billion, and we're increasing funding for every single hospital in Ontario this year. This is part of our, year, our budget pr uh, proposal of $1 billion in increase to health care funding, and we'll continue to in invest in hospitals, and we must recognize that we're moving towards a system where more services are delivered at home and in the community. Mr. Speaker, the NDP voted against these very measures. They voted against an additional $270 million for Answer. home and community care. They voted against $75 million for community-based hospice and palliative care, and they voted against $85 million for community health centers. We're investing more, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yeah. Supplementary. Yes, yes, in fact, Speaker, we did vote against a terrible austerity budget, and we're proud of it. Here are the facts, Speaker. People in Aurelia have learned that 16 beds at Aurelia Soldiers Memorial Hospital will be closed, and the hospital is losing 35 full-time equivalent staff. They're losing seven full-time RNs four part-time RNs and a nurse practitioner. And the CEO says this, Speaker, and I quote, on the heels of a four-year funding freeze and only a modest increase to base funding for 2016-17, it's increasingly difficult, end quote. When will the Liberal government stop cutting hospitals, Speaker? <laughs> Minister of Health. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank. Uh, I appreciate the question from the uh, leader of the third party because it uh, allows me to set the record straight when it comes to Soldiers Memorial. And we're investing an additional $1.3 million in that hospital this year. But let's hear what else the CEO of that hospital said. She actually said, and it was based on there's a rehabilitation alliance, the Rehabilitative, rehabilitative Care Alliance, which is a provincial-wide body, and they're making changes which are in accordance to and, in fact, recommended by that alliance. So the major budget initiative, in fact, is a bed restructuring plan that will see the establishment of a newly designed program to enhance care for patients. This is quoting the CEO, requiring post-acute rehabilitation services and medical care. To develop this new model of care, the hospital has withdrawn from the regional continuing uh, complex continuing Answer. care program, but relocating other beds from within the hospital to the new unit to be established on the fourth floor, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Speaker, we're going to have to rehabilitate the entire hospital system after this Liberal government gets finished with it. In Windsor, hospitals, health care workers, in Windsor hospitals, health care workers right now know that their cuts are coming. The situation has gotten so bad, Speaker, that nurses are getting second jobs and some are leaving in advance because they're so worried about the layoff notices that are coming. They're so stressed about the, the impending layoff notices that they're actually leaving their jobs before the, the pink slip hits them. That's bad for nurses, but it's also bad for patients. When will this Liberal government start putting patients first and stop cutting hospitals and firing nurses? Thank you. Minister. So, Mr. Speaker, every single indicator that we have with reference to our nurses, despite the fact that the NDP, of course, fired thousands of nurses when they were in, in, in uh, power in the 1990s, registered nurses since 2003, a 12.8% increase, nurse practitioners a 312% increase in the number of nurse practitioners practicing in the province, registered practical nurses a 45% increase. Mr. Speaker, every single measure that we have, and these are independent figures and statistics from the college. Every single figure we have demonstrates this government's commitment to continue to hire nurses to provide that important, exceptional frontline care that they do each and every single day. Thank you. New question? New question, the member from Perth, Wellington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Community and Social Services. The minister was asked if she knew about the problem with SAMS before it was launched. The minister said, nobody told me. Will the minister now admit that just wasn't true, and will she apologize to the people of Ontario? Thank you. Mr. Community and Social Services. 
Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I think I've acknowledged many times in this House that SAMS did not roll out the way it should have. No one's denying this. But let's be clear about what we're talking about. A memo was released. It was written by the project manager for SAMS, and it was addressed to the administrators out in the field. And uh, I would like to read that memo in its entirety. Uh, what he said on November the 1st was, I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge that there have been significant challenges, both with the development of the solution and with site readiness. However, this was not unexpected in such a large and complex modernization initiative, and in every instance we have worked together to overcome these challenges. This was precisely uh, the type of information that Order. was relied upon to roll out SAMS on, in November of 2014. Answer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I didn't hear an apology. When the minister said nobody told me, that wasn't true. Plain and simple. On November 1st, the minister received a memo from the SAMS team leader which said the system faced significant challenges. I'm get the message. Withdraw, please. Okay, the system was faced with significant challenges. That means she had time to stop the release of SAMS before the damage was done. Instead, she assured everyone that she was confident SAMS would have a seamless rollout the following week. In previous governments, a scandal like this would have triggered resignations. Has anyone in this government accepted the consequences for such a monumental screw-up? Anyone at all? because this minister hasn't. I'd like to reiterate that the memo in question was sent not to me, but to administrators in the field. And uh, what I'd like to point out... The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, is warned. Finish, please. So I'm wondering if the member opposite is suggesting that he would have pushed the stop button on much-needed innovation based on knowing there were challenges that had been overcome. Yes. Having said that, Mr. Speaker, we know that challenges did exist with the rollout, and I have uh, accepted the responsibility for that. I started staff working groups, frontline working groups. We hired uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers to assist us in a third-party evaluation of what needed to be done, and we have now fixed 100% of the priority issues identified by the front lines and 95% of the defects identified in the uh, audit agenda. Thank you. New question, the member from Bramley, Gore Malton. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Attorney General. When it comes to police accountability, transparency, and accountability and oversight, this government has been all over the place on this file. The, and it's really done a disservice to not only the people of Ontario, but to the family of Mr. Andrew Loku. Transparency is vital to maintaining public trust in the administration of justice in our justice system. First, the Attorney General took 30 days to read a report that only she could read. Then, while the Premier made some promising remarks about perhaps releasing this report, the Attorney General said no to questions asked by media to releasing this report four times. Now, finally, when the government releases the report, they release it late on a Friday. Uh, they release only 10 out of 34 pages, and one of those pages is blank. The pages that are released are heavily redacted, and in fact, the public is left with more Question. questions rather than answers. Why does the con government continue to disrespect Ontarians and discourage transparency by turn after turn? Thank you. Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from the third party for his uh, very important question. Uh, as I said, you know, our government is very committed to uh, effective and fair civilian oversight of the police. We are aware that there are concerns about transparency and accountability in the current police oversight. So the time has come, Mr. Speaker, to uh, look critically at how this system is working. So that's why last week uh, uh, we have appointed the Honorable Michael Tollock, who is from the Appeal Court of Ontario, to lead an independent review of three agencies that oversee police conduct in Ontario. 
uh, he has been asked to provide the government with a recommendation on ways to enhance the transparency and accountability of the provinces and through police oversight bodies. And today, I want to thank him to um, accept to take this very challenging review. Thank, thank you, Mr. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, while New Democrats welcome the, this commission well, and welcome the appointment of Justice Tulloch, that doesn't answer the question of transparency. The government likes to talk about transparency time and time again, but when it comes to it, the government does not act on that. The government has failed to act on delivering true transparency. The community has raised a number of concerns around the circumstance of Mr. Loku's death, but the government has an opportunity to provide the transparency. They like to talk about it, but again, they haven't delivered on it. The public have questions. Mr. Andrew Loku's family have questions. This government can provide the answers. Will the government commit today to releasing a fulsome report understanding the concerns around privacy, but release a report that actually answers the questions that the community has. Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, this uh, SIU process is in existence since 1990, and I'll remind the uh, member from the opposite that when they were in power, they did not release any of the ah. SIU report. So we have asked Justice Talak to prioritize uh, making recommendations as to how information in SIU reports could be made public in the future. He will also prioritize looking at whether past SIU reports should be made public and the form this information would take. The government is expected to receive these prioritized recommendations in the coming months. Justice Talak will conduct broad public consultation, including conversation with police community, Black Lives Matter, and a variety of municipal and community leaders. So I'm confident that through this uh, review Answer. process, we will create a more transparent approach to police oversight that has the confidence of both the police and the public. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question, the member from Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Each year, the four credit rating agencies assess the province's fiscal and economic plan following the release of the budget, and their assessment provides an independent analysis and assessment, which they communicate through their rating and outlook for the province. And, Mr. Speaker, the results are in for the first of the four credit rating agencies, as Moody's made their assessment public last week. So can the minister please inform this House on the status of Moody's rating and what this means for our government's record on fiscal prudence? Thank you. Minister Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, I'd like to thank the, the, member from, the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore for the question, who's quite right. Following a thorough review of our government's economic and fiscal plan, Moody's recently announced an improvement of the province's rating. Here, here. Moody's outlook reflects its confidence in our government's plan to grow Ontario's economy and create jobs for Ontario. The member is also correct in saying that Moody's is the first of the rating agencies to release its rating. Our government values the input of third-party analysis as an important checkpoint, ensuring that our fiscal plan is credible, reliable, and transparent. Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to hear of the improvement to our government's outlook by Moody's and know that this is a result of, the, of a credible fiscal plan and the hard work that the Minister of Finance has done. As the press release by Moody's stated, the stable outlook on the province of Ontario's ratings reflects our opinion that the province has presented a budget plan with little risk that the debt burden will exceed recent levels. They also forecast Ontario's debt to fall across the medium term, as importantly for interest expense to remain manageable as well. Mr. Speaker, it sounds to me like our government is doing a great job at coming to balance in a way that it's fair and responsible. And Can the Minister of Finance please inform this House about the status of our fiscal plan and provide some insight into why Moody's made this change? Question. Thank you. Minister. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the member for allowing me the opportunity to speak about our fiscal plan and the improvement of our outlook, which was, by the way, well received by many investors around the world. Yeah, yeah. As it was recently affirmed in a 2016 budget that our government remains on track to eliminate the deficit by 2017-18 and remain in balance by 2018-19. By continuing to beat our fiscal targets, Ontario's accumulated deficit is $30 billion lower than it otherwise would have been. And across the board, private sector economists are forecasting Ontario's economy to be among the top two growth leaders in Canada. 
and we will continue to reduce the deficit through a fair and balanced approach, Mr. Speaker. We continue to implement our plan to balance the budget, grow the economy, create jobs, and Ontarians will continue to see measurable results, as already seen around the world, who value the work that we've done here in Ontario. Thank you very much, Peter. My question is to the Minister of Energy. The Minister will know that hydro rates went up again yesterday. May 1st, hydro rates went up. And the latest line, unbelievable line from the government, is that the increases are due to the fact that people didn't use enough electricity. Mm -hmm. So in this liberal energy system, people are penalized when it's a cold winter, they are penalized when it's a warm winter, and they are punished even more when they conserve electricity. Will the minister finally admit that the people's skyrocketing energy rates are not a result of weather? But the colossal mismanagement of Ontario's electricity system under your, his guidance, and will he commit to a real plan to stop abusing Ontarians with skyrocketing hydro rates? Thank you. You seated, please. You seated, please. Thank you, Minister of Energy. Speaker, the member is correct that uh, there was a 2.5% uh, increase, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and as I said last week, Mr. Speaker, and the week before, Mr. Speaker, the member ignores the fact that if you look at comparisons to other provinces, BC Hydro rates increased by 4% on April 1, 2016. Saskatchewan Power rates approved an increase of 5% throughout 2015, Mr. Speaker. Manitoba Hydro applied for a rate increase of 3.95% as of April 1, 2016. Mr. Speaker, and Newfoundland Power applied for a rate increase of 3.6% uh, for residential customers as of July 1, 2016. And as I said earlier today, Mr. Speaker, Northern Ontario has the lowest industrial rates, third lowest industrial rates uh, in North America, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. The minister has to stop with the numbers games. Quebec's hydro rates could, could go up 300% and they'd still be lower than ours. You know, stop with the numbers game because you are inflicting real pain on Ontario families. I had a gentleman in my constituency office on Friday who said this hydro fiasco that you've created here is tearing families apart. I spoke to a woman yesterday in my constituency who works at a food bank in Eganville. She said 30% increase at the food bank. They ran out. And when you talk to people and ask them why they're at the food bank, it's because they have to make a choice. If we pay our hydro bill, we can't afford the food. That's what you've done here in the province of Ontario. Will you show some compassion and stop going down the disastrous road that you built for Ontario families? You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Minister. The member knows that we've created a number of significant programs, Mr. Speaker, to help consumers, including removal of a debt retirement charge at the beginning of the year, Mr. Speaker. We've created the Ontario Electricity Support Program, Mr. Speaker, for low and modest income families that would save them an additional $360 per year off their bills, or $430 when combined with the removal of the debt retirement charge. But I do want to thank the uh, Conservative Party again, Mr. Speaker, for supporting our nuclear refurbishment program, which sees over the next 30 years, Mr. Speaker, an average price of 7.7 .7 cents per kilowatt hour, Mr. Speaker. Some people here have W's. Speaker, thanking the Conservative Party for supporting our initiative that, uh, in nuclear refurbishment, which shows 7.7 .7 cents per kilowatt hour, Mr. Speaker, on average over the next 30 years, Answer. and that is clean energy, Mr. Speaker. We're taking a lot of other steps, Mr. Speaker, to reduce the cost of electricity, including the new price Thank of you. wind, Mr. Speaker, which is comparable to the rest of the generation. Thank you. Your question, the member from Tenants, James today. My uh, question is to the Minister of Transportation. Minister, you will note, because I'm sure your staff watches this, that about a week ago there was a 26, liter, uh, 26 cent per litre difference on the price of gas from southern to northern Ontario. And within northern Ontario, there was a 10 cent a litre difference between Kirkland Lake and Timmins. The question is very simple. When is this minister and this government going to get on side and do what we've been asking and what municipalities across the north have been asking, and that is to either get these gas companies to stop gouging the public, if not regulate the price of gas? 
Well, thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to begin by thanking the member opposite for the question. I'm happy to take that one back, have a conversation with the member offline. Of course, you would know, cutting across all of the activity that this government does, thanks not only to the Premier, but of course to members like the Minister of Northern Development and Mines, the Minister of Government and Consumer Services, the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry, and also the member from Sudbury. You know that this is a government that for 13 years has worked very hard on a determined fashion to make sure that Northern Ontarians have a bright and prosperous future, that the quality of life for Northern Ontarians continues to improve, Speaker, including in Budget 2016, of course. A number, for example, Speaker, from the Ministry of Transportation, a number of initiatives on the infrastructure front to support highway expansion, roads, bridges, and so much more for all of Northern Ontario. Speaker, for 13 years, thanks to this Ontario Liberal government, we have moved the yardsticks forward for Answer. Northern Ontario. And because of our leadership, Speaker, unlike the NDP, we'll continue to get the job done. Mr. Mr. Speaker, as my colleague was just saying, we've gone from question period to comedy hour. This government is the same government who got rid of the Ontario Northland, the only train that we have in Northern Ontario. This is a government who has driven the price of electricity through the roof to the point that residents and industry can't afford it. And now I'm asking him the question about the price of gas. How could it be that gas companies are able to charge a 26 cents per litre difference for gasoline across this province? If you can sell a case of beer in Kenora for the same price you sell it in downtown Toronto, how is it that you're going to have a 26 cent a litre difference on the price of gas? I ask you again, are you prepared to step in and get these guys under control, and if not, regulate them? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I think the member knows that the regulation of uh, the price of gasoline is federal responsibility uh, under the Competition uh, Act, Mr. Speaker. And I think if he wants, he, he he's talking about he's talking about a differential in price. Really? So does he want the same price? Does he want price control? If he wants price control, tell him he wants price control. Okay? We know what happens when you have price control. The provinces who have tried to regulate, Mr. Speaker, have seen their prices stay the same as the other provinces, or they went up, Mr. Speaker, because of the cost of administrating the price control they're trying to implement, Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from Ottawa. Merci, Monsieur le Président. My question is to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister, we all know that sexual violence has a devastating impact on the lives of survivors and their families. As a member of the Select Committee on Sexual Violence and Harassment, I heard many touching personal accounts of this kind of violence. Speaker, it was clear to me that we as a province need to do more to eliminate sexual violence and harassment right across Ontario. But because crimes of sexual violence and harassment are the most unreported in our province, it is imperative that we improve the experience of survivors who come forward to report these crimes through better tools and training for our police and law enforcement officials. <coughs> Minister, I was pleased to join you in Ottawa in February when you announced the funding of six research projects at post-secondary institutions across the province Question. dedicated to improving how police respond. So, through you to the Minister, to, uh, through to the Mr. Speaker, would the minister please explain how he is addressing this very, very real and Thank pressing you. gap? Thank you. Minister, Thank you very much, Speaker. I want to thank the member from Ottawa Orléans uh, for her work along with other members um, on the Select Committee on Sexual Violence and Harassment. Uh, speaker. Uh, speaker, sexual violence and harassment is something that is far too prevalent um, in our communities and something that will, uh, cannot be tolerated. That is why, Speaker, I was very happy to join the member from Ottawa Orléans in February to announce that we are investing $375,000 to support six research projects at post-secondary institutions across the province to provide our police and law enforcement officials with the tools and training they need in order uh, to best support survivors of these terrible crimes. This research is about identifying best practices based on evidence. It is about supporting an even more compassionate and sensitive approach uh, from law enforcement. It is about learning and implementing best practices Answer. to encourage more survivors to report sexual violence and continue to improve how police respond to and investigate cases of sexual violence. Thank you. Thank speaker. you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that answer. I am glad to hear that you're taking concrete steps to better support survivors of sexual violence and harassment and improve training for the police who respond to these crimes. 
While this research will be important in addressing this issue, we must also recognize that Indigenous women are disproportionately likely to experience violence. In fact, they are three times as likely compared to other women in Canada. Our First Nation partners have told us that there has always been a gap in the justice system. So as we move forward to eliminate sexual violence from our communities, we cannot lose sight of the Indigenous women who need our help the most. That means that we must work to develop a more compassionate, sensitive and culturally appropriate response for law enforcement when dealing with sexual violence against Indigenous women Question. while encouraging more survivors to report. So, Mr. Speaker, through you, would the minister please explain what our government is doing to identify the gaps and best practice to help Indigenous women Thank across you. Ontario? Thank you, uh, Speaker. Yes, Speaker, it is, it is unfortunate that Indigenous women are disproportionately likely to experience violence, and as the member stated, that uh, in fact they are three times as likely to be impacted by uh, compared to other women in Canada. Speaker, this must change. That is why last month, along with the Minister responsible for women's issues and the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs, I announced that we are providing over $250,000 to support research that will specifically draw on the lived experiences of Indigenous survivors of sexual violence. These research projects will build on the Walking Together, Ontario's long-term strategy to end violence against Indigenous women and, Speaker, our It's Never Okay action plan. They will examine how police respond to and investigate these crimes, and it is my hope that this research will show us how to improve support and empower Answer. Indigenous survivors. Speaker, this is how our government is working to identify the gaps and best practices so we can develop tools to improve police responses and investigations to help Indigenous women across the province. Hey. Thank you. New question, the member from uh, Bruce Taylor South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. This government promised to improve the quality of education in the classroom, but it isn't happening. It's clear that ever since the Liberals fast-tracked the reviews of school closings to 10 weeks from seven months, communities are literally being torn apart. In my riding, five schools are closing. OSCBI alumni, parents and students have appealed to the minister to step in and review the decision, a call that's supported by over 2,100 petitioners. Mr. Speaker, these constituents want to know, will the minister support a one-year moratorium on the decision and allow the community, the students and all stakeholder groups to consult on the proposal to close OSCBI? Thank you. Minister of Education. Yes, and uh, I'm quite happy to uh, comment on uh, Blue Water District School Board, which is about what uh, the issue is about. Um, actually, we had a, a really interesting event on Friday in Meaford, uh, where the Blue Water Board had, in fact, used the new, actually expedited ARC process. Uh, as a result of that expedited ARC process, they will be uh, closing two of their existing elementary schools. They will be closing a, an older high school as well. And we actually announced that they will be receiving $24 million in the small community of Meaford to, in order to build a new 1,000 JK to 12 schools to consolidate all three of those schools. The community, Answer. including the Demer, was absolutely delighted. Supplementary. It's unfortunate, Mr. Speaker, that the minister didn't have the decency to invite the representative of that riding to that announcement. Despite promising to address the funding formula in the past two elections, it appears the minister is indifferent to the predicament they're creating and the impact of school closures on people in their communities. You'd never do that. This attitude runs parallel to their waste and mismanagement pattern, the same one that has led the government to cut back in funding essential public services such as education and health care. Minister, you control the purse strings. You set the rules of the funding formula. You said you would change it. A busload of constituents will be arriving any minute, and they want assurances from you that you'll do the right thing. Mr. Speaker, I ask again through you, will the minister agree to a review of this decision to ensure the students' best interests are served at the end of the day by this government, and not about Meaford School, it's about the OSCVI School? 
Yes, thank you very much. And as, as I did uh, comment to the reporters from Own Sound on Friday, we need to sort out the process here. Is that it actually, under the Education Act, falls within the jurisdiction of school boards, not the Minister of Education, to make decisions about accommodation Order. reviews. That in fact the uh, the the, uh, the the boards are charged with that responsibility. But I would like to point out, Speaker, that I am the Minister of Education, not the Minister of Schools. And my primary focus is to make sure that students receive good programming. And what we know in secondary schools is that when there's a critical mass of students, that the board has the opportunity to provide a broader Answer. set of programs for the students, that they can provide better quality programming. And that actually is my job Thank you. to make sure students receive. Thank you. New question, the Leader of the Third Party. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Acting Premier. Throughout its history, TTC fairs in Toronto have been based on the simple principle that every Torontonian deserves equal access to their transit system, regardless of their income and regardless of where they live. But now, Metrolinx is quietly working on a fair integration plan that could force people living in Scarborough, Etobicoke and North York to pay a higher fare for a subway ride than people living downtown. Will the Liberal government guarantee that Metrolinx will not force people living in Scarborough to pay more to ride the subway. Thanks very much, Speaker. I want to uh, thank the leader of the NDP for the question. Of course, as everyone should know by now, uh, the folks at Metrolinx who are doing an exceptional job are working hard to liaise with all of our municipal transit systems around the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area to make sure that collectively, Speaker, we can deliver on fair integration for this region. I think anyone who moves around the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area would recognize, and certainly I hear it loud and clear from my own constituents in York Region, that we need to make sure, in order to support the unprecedented transit investments that this government is making, that we need a fair integration system across this entire region that works seamlessly, that, is, uh, that makes transit more accessible, more affordable, more reliable, more dependable for the people of the entire region. And that's the work that Metrolinx is embarking upon in conjunction with all of our municipal transit systems. They'll keep working hard yes, speaker, to make sure that we can get it right. Thank you very much. Well, Speaker, in fact, what Metrolinx has been quietly doing is designing a fair integration plan that could force the TTC to become a zone-based system that divides Torontonians based on where they live. So years from now, people in Scarborough might get a new subway, but then find out that they can only afford to ride the bus. Will the Liberal government guarantee that there will be no fair zones within Toronto and that Metrolinx will not force the TTC to charge higher fares for subway riders? Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Speaker. I guess only the leader of Ontario's NDP would think somehow that after months of open conversations, after months in which every single board meeting has a public portion speaker, only the leader of Ontario's NDP would think that this is somehow hidden. It's a conversation that's been ongoing. It's part of my mandate letter, which of course, Speaker, she should know. For the first time in Ontario's history, our mandate letters were, were posted publicly at the time that we received them, Speaker. I think what's also perhaps the reason that the leader of the NDP is mistaken about how supposedly hidden this effort is, Speaker, is that because while we are investing in transit through budget after budget after budget, that leader, the NDP caucus, continue to vote against them. They are obviously more focused on petty partisan politics in Scarborough instead of being focused on making sure Answer. that they support the transit investments needed to deliver the seamless integrated transit network the people of this region and the people of Scarborough deserve. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Tooth decay is one of the most prevalent yet preventable chronic diseases, particularly among children. It is a leading cause of day surgery for those ages 1 to 5. 
Research shows that untreated oral health problems can affect children's ability to eat, sleep, and focus. In my riding of Scarborough Agent Court, it is not unusual to see children whose growth and development is impacted by poor oral health. There is unacceptable disparity in health outcomes between lower and higher socioeconomic individuals in this province and is true to health, dental health as well. Speaker, through you to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care, can he please inform the House what the government is doing to ensure that children in my riding of Scarborough Question. Agent Court and across Ontario receive proper dental health they deserve? Thank you. Uh, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I have to say it was great being with the member uh, from Scarborough Agent Court and many of uh, her MPP colleagues from Durham and Scarborough last week when we announced a $20 million investment to diagnostic imaging at Scarborough Hospital and a $5 million planning grant as well for both Durham and Scarborough regions. But as the Minister of Health and as a parent, I want to see all children grow up to be healthy and live healthy lives. And the family income level should not be a barrier to that. That's why I was pleased last week to announce that our government is supporting families and raising healthy kids by making it easier for more eligible children and youth from low-income families to access free dental health services in Ontario. The new Healthy Smiles Ontario program provides access to free preventive, routine and emergency dental services for all eligible children and youth. I'm very proud of our government's Healthy Smiles program, Mr. Speaker. It's an important step in Ontario's overall poverty and, reduction strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response, but also for his leadership role in supporting Scarborough. Healthy Smiles is an excellent oral health program run by the public health units across Ontario. This type of preventive treatment, whether it's checkup, cleaning, fillings, x-rays, we know in the long run it saves our health care system dollars. Studies show that early detection and identification of oral disease are critical in the children's overall health, social well-being, and learning. As a former public health nurse and a school board trustee, I know the free Healthy Smiles Dental Health Care Program will help children in my riding of Scarborough Aging Court across Ontario improve their oral health, keep them out of the emergency room, ensure proper nutrition, promote self-esteem, and reduce absenteeism from schools. Speaker, through you to the minister, can he please tell the House how the families can access healthy smile programs. Question. Thank you, Minister. Well, and thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as part of this new and improved program where we merged six different programs with a different set of rules and six different applications into one program with one application and one set of rules, Mr. Speaker, 70,000 more kids will have access to these important services. And I'm pleased to report back today that already more than 323,000 young people are enrolled in the Healthy Smiles program. And to bring that number even higher, we launched an awareness campaign last week across the province to encourage more people to enroll and to visit Ontario.ca Healthy Smiles to find out if their kids are eligible and to sign them up for these important publicly funded dental services. Families can also speak to their local public health unit. Of course, our public health units are essential partners, and I want to thank them and our other partners, including our dentists, as we roll out this important yes, program. Before we go to new questions, just to re remind the member from Windsor West, it really doesn't matter where you sit. Thank you. Member from Elgin, Middlesex, London. Mr. Speaker, Speaker, my question is the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Mr. Speaker, a recent Toronto Sun article detailed the government's failures for patients with diabetes. This particular patient had to have her left foot amputated and came close to having to amputate her other foot due to a lack of preventative foot care. 2012 report released by Canada's premiers revealed that an estimated 85% of leg amputations are the result of a non-healing foot ulcer. The report recommended the use of the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario's Best Practices Guide to prevent the need for amputation. But four years later, about 2,000 patients are forced to undergo physically and emotionally traumatic amputations each year. Mr. Speaker, why has the minister failed to implement RNAO's preventative measures that could save millions of dollars and thousands of limbs in Ontario's diabetic patients? Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I, uh, I have to commend RNAO and, as well, the Canadian Association of Wound Care, both of whom are participating in a Health Quality Ontario uh, task force or a uh, working group that uh, I asked uh, HQO to set up to look specifically at these issues. And so we're getting, we're hearing from the best experts right across this country on this important issue. It shouldn't. It's unacceptable that the level of amputation that we're seeing. The it's important that we have a. Wound 
wound care approach, which uh, is based on best practices and base, best principles, that that is applied province-wide. So we've gathered together the experts, and we've, uh, of course, RNAO is part of that process, and as I mentioned, the Canadian Association of Wound Care. So we can actually hear from them, work with them in this working group to develop those standards of care and implement them across Answer. the province, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you. Uh, back again to the Minister of Health. Mr. That uh, task force should have been called four years ago after the Premier's uh, report came out, not four years later, and, and patients suffering uh, for four continued years. But the Canadian Diabetes Association, Mr. Speaker, reported the economic burden of diabetes was estimated to be $4.9 billion in 2010 and expected to increase to $6.9 billion by 2020. Estimated 1.5 million people in Ontario have diabetes, and that's to grow to 2.3 million people by 2025. These Ontarians are 12 times more likely to be hospitalized with end-stage renal disease and 20 times more likely to be hospitalized for lower limb amputation than the general public. Could the minister explain why prevention is not a priority in this government? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, of course it's a priority, and that's why we're looking at wound care. We're also looking at offloading, uh, which is an important aspect of this in terms of prevention and best, uh, best practices for management. But I need to remind the member opposite that Ontario was the first province or territory in Canada to fully fund insulin pumps for children and adults with type 1 diabetes. We've established six centres for complex diabetic uh, diabetes care. They've provided care to over 9,000 uh, new patients. We've increased the number of diabetes education teams, which I suspect the member opposite would agree is a preventive aspect of care. Uh, we now have 321 diabetes education teams across the province. We have diabetes mobile outreach services, and we've invested in self-management as well, Mr. Speaker, making sure that individuals like my sister who has type 1 diabetes Answer. to make sure that they have the education and support that they need to be able to uh, live those highest quality lives. Lives, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Labour. Uh, Speaker, last week we learned that the Ontario government recovered nearly $140,000 in wages owed by 18 firms to interns after a ministry blitz of a small number of DTA workplaces. The results of the blitz are deeply troubling. Of the 36 firms with interns that were subject to the Employment Standards Act, fully half were not meeting their obligations under the ESA. Speaker, it seems that the minister's efforts to educate employers are not working. While the Blitz stopped the exploitation of unpaid interns at 18 firms, what is the minister doing to protect the thousands of other young people who are working without pay at hundreds more firms across the province? Thank Speaker. you. Minister Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to uh, the member for this important question. Contrary to the assertions that are made by the member, I would say the work we are doing on unpaid internships in this province is working, and thanks to the work that we were able to do with the Ministry of Labour and the Blitz, young people in this province will now be receiving $140,000 that they wouldn't have otherwise received, Speaker. Let me make it perfectly clear. Unpaid internships are illegal in the province of Ontario. There's no such thing as a legal unpaid internship, Speaker. If there are employers out there today, and the Blitz shows us there are, if there are employers out there today that still do, don't understand or they decide not to follow the rules, we're going to continue to level that playing field for other employers in this province that do abide by the rules, Speaker. I'm proud we were able to recover the money for these young people that deserve that money, Speaker. Thank you. The member from Kitchener, Conestoga, on a point of order. Point of order. Yeah, I'd like to welcome Pathfinder Christian School to question period today. Thanks, guys, for coming. Thank you. <laughs> member for Barry on a point of order. Yes, Speaker, I'd like to wish a very happy birthday to uh, the member from Brampton Springdale, who celebrated her birthday on April the 27th. Thank you. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member from Timmins James Bay has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Minister of Transportation concerning gas prices. This matter will be debated tomorrow at 6 p.m. There being no further deferred votes, this House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.